In 2007, Pastor John was speaking at the Desiring God Conference, John Piper's conference. And he was asked to address how to have a long enduring ministry. So this was 16 years ago and it blessed my heart to watch it. And at that point, Pastor John was 39 minis- 30, 39 years into the ministry. And uh, I can't imagine anybody better today or then 16 years ago um, to explain how to have a long enduring ministry. And in doing so, you'll see Pastor John uh, very transparent, very open and honest, including talking about the time when 250 people left the church and a time when there was a mutiny among the pastors. Um, So I'm going to play a portion of this. I'll come back with additional comments, and uh, I'll tell you where to watch the rest of the sermon. I am a recipient of God's blessing poured out through John Piper and have been for many years indebted to him for his writings and his preaching. There aren't a whole lot of preachers that, that I listen to. He is one at the top of the list, and it's just an honor for me to be here a joy to come and be a part of the Desiring God conference. And I, I trust that uh, in the process of me being abundantly blessed already, I may be able, by the grace of God, to leave you with a small blessing. But if not, it will have been well worth it for me alone to be here just to, uh, just to enjoy the fellowship. It's a big subject to talk about, to stand, to endure. I remember as a young boy... My dad reminding me of the words of the Apostle Paul, having done all to stand. And he said to me when I was very young, he said, a lot of people have done a lot of things, but when the smoke clears and the dust settles, they're not standing. And he directed me in those early years to the words of the Apostle Paul, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. And he challenged me very early in my life to make that my goal. He went to heaven two years ago at the age of 91 and into his 91st year was still teaching a Bible class every Sunday. His father, my grandfather, died at a much earlier age of cancer And I remember as a small boy standing by his bed when I think I was about nine or ten and my dad saying to him, Dad, is there anything you want? And he said, I want to preach one more sermon. You see, he had prepared one and didn't get to preach it. It's like fire in your bones. And so my dad took his notes, printed them up, and passed out the sermon at his funeral. By the way, the title of the sermon was Heavenly Records. So he preached on heaven from heaven. And that's how he went out. I have a great legacy of men who have been faithful to the very end. As John said, uh, almost 40 years at Grace Community Church. Can you imagine those poor souls? Baptizing, seeing come to Christ, third generation. Last Sunday night, I baptized two more of my own grandchildren. Having baptized my own children, I stood in the waters and heard the precious testimonies of Ty and Olivia from two different families of my children and could hardly contain my gratitude to God for His grace in their lives through that church. I think I'm leaking here somewhere. Get this back where it belongs, if I can. I I really do believe that when people say, you know, what's been the greatest influence on the life of your children, the answer, of course, is the the work of the Spirit of God. But beyond that is the tremendous, relentless, comprehensive, and unified effort of a whole congregation of people to bring to bear the truth on their young lives. 
So my delight to be in one church all these years and to see my family grow in that church. I, I don't know if this is going to work, guys. Let me see here. I'm uh, technologically challenged. Yeah, maybe that's simpler. Will that work better? Does that is that on now? Okay, we'll just do that. I'm a talking head anyway, so let's let's hide this somewhere. I, I really prayed that this would happen when I got up here. This is my my real wish that I would fumble around like a fool with the microphone anyway. So be it. <laughs> I, I really have lived in, in my church life on the backside of when you're supposed to leave and nobody wants you. Uh, several times during the life of our church, I thought that I, I should leave the church. Uh, I, I walked into a staff meeting one day. I had invested in five young guys, discipled them personally, uh, loved them, um, met with them early hours of the morning during the week, and went over spiritual things and prayed with them and, and built them into a staff of, of pastors who worked alongside of me. And I walked in one day and I said, I just want to tell you guys how much I love you. To which one of them responded, uh, well, if uh, you think we're your friends, you got another thing coming, buddy. And a mutiny on the spot. Try to overthrow my role as pastor, take me out of the pulpit, and the sad fallout of that was four out of the five left the ministry for life. It was more than I could bear. And I, I would have gone if there was anywhere to go. That was about eight years in. About 18 years in, 250 people left the church. And I began to question everything. They said my preaching was too long, too irrelevant, too dull, and a whole lot of other things. And 250 people left the church led by elders. And again, I would have gone, but there wasn't anybody inviting me to go. So I'm on the backside of when you're supposed to go and nobody wants you. And I will tell you this, that... I thank God that I'm still there because this is this is the best, the most wonderful, the most satisfying, the most fulfilling time in my entire life. I thank God for every day that I can shepherd that church. And all those other things I do just kind of are peripheral. It's it's the congregation at Grace Church and the people I work with there. That's that's my my passion. And people have asked me, you know, how do you have a long, enduring ministry? And if I can, I want, to, I want to speak from the personal viewpoint. I know there are not all of you are going to be in ministry, but I only have one life to speak from, and this is it. And when people ask me, how, how do you have such a long ministry? The first answer I give is, well, you have to live. And that's, that's a divine thing, you know. You have to survive. You can't be David Brainerd and have a long, enduring ministry. You know? So, by the grace of God, he's given me strength and life all these years. And so, from God's viewpoint, it's life and health and divine, sovereign providence working in a myriad of ways, known and unknown to me, that has kept me where I am. But what about from my side? What, what about my side of this? What's my perspective on an enduring ministry? And I will tell you immediately, I'm not here to offer you any clever insights. I'm not here to offer you any novel approaches, any imaginative, uh, imaginative or intuitive ideas that I've managed to develop. I have no technique that I can turn to. I've had no strategy. There's been no scheme to do this. It is as, in some ways, much a surprise to me as it would be to anybody else. 
But there is one thing that I have endeavored to do, and that is to, to focus my entire life on principles, on doctrines, if you will, on divine truths. While all the circumstances ebb and flow and the sands shift, the rock is the rock of truth and spiritual principle. There is genuinely, I think, a spiritual or doctrinal structure that undergirds everything for me. And Paul, the apostle, has been my model for that. From the time that my dad first talked to me about Paul's final words, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, I wanted that to be my goal. But that doesn't happen because you wish it to happen. You can't speak it into existence, contrary to what some people say. And when you come to the end of his letter, second letter to Timothy, and you see him there, and he's at the Everest of his life, breathing that rarefied air of those who have climbed to the very pinnacle and made the climb with nobility, and integrity, even though all in Asia had forsaken him, even though those that were closest to him had gone. And the rest of that chapter indicates that it was life as usual with all of its normal disappointments. There was no great crowd cheering him when he reached that epic moment. In fact, the church had largely turned their affections away from him and the world was about to chop his head off. You ask the question, how did he get there? Especially given what he endured. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians for a moment. And I want to break this into two parts, one tonight and one tomorrow. and Just have you kind of work through this with me a little bit. You have to understand that Life was extremely difficult for this man. And obviously we can't cover all of those things, but there are many things that are indicated to us in this. And that ought to pique your interest into the sermon that Pastor John is putting together. Um, again, 2007, so 16 years ago, Pastor John, neat to see him open, transparent, joking, Still, today, he's much the same. Um, link to watch the rest of that sermon can be found in the description of this video. Now, this is part one, and I have been looking for part two. So, <laughs> when I find part two, I'll, I'll share that with you. So, that's September 28th, 2007. Pastor John at the Desiring God Conference. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I, I will read all your comments. Um, we continue to pray for Pastor John and Patricia. Um, Patricia recovering from um, a stumble she had. Um, I've got no new news on that. If you have updated on her health, uh, we, we'll just continue to pray and assume all is well because um, we haven't heard anything else. But uh, Pastor John, how to have a long enduring ministry. Um, man, he's been through a lot, <clears throat> been through a lot. And I'm sure that, uh, just as he said in 2007, he would say today, and which he does say today that it's right now is the most fulfilling time, um, in his ministry. He could have never dreamt that God would, um, use him in the way that he has in the past, uh, four or five years. Um, just amazing. There's a lot of good pastors out there. I hope you have one. Pastor John is one. I have one at my local assembly, and I hope you have one too. Um, but we don't worship these men. They're gifts from God to help us understand the scriptures and to strengthen us and encourage us. So leave your comments below. If you appreciate what I do here, uh, link in the description of this video uh, to support BTWN ministry, YouTube channel, BTW Network, and the like. So 
Hope you're doing well. Until next video, my prayer is that God would bless each and every one of you. See you.